Patus et à toutes. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Aldria Martel. I'm the director of the Spirit Change Program. Uh, welcome to this live bilingual session on baseline survey. Uh, for those who are joining one of our activity for the first time, so the, the Spirit Change Program is a five-year initiative funded by Global Affairs Canada, aiming to increase the effectiveness, effectiveness of Canadian small and medium organizations. So during the next five years, we will organize capacity building and knowledge sharing opportunities for small and medium organizations in Canada. So at the end of this live session, I'm happy to share with you a few upcoming uh, activities and trainings uh, with you. Uh, before moving forward with this session today, I would like to share some information for those joining the call in French. So I will switch in French uh, for a few minutes. Donc, euh, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Bienvenue à cette euh, session sur euh, les enquêtes de référence. Mon nom est Andréanne Martel. Euh, je suis la directrice du programme euh, Activer le changement. Donc, pour vous euh, joindre à la session en français, donc, euh, vous devez faire deux étapes. Donc, une étape de plus que les participants, participants anglophones. Donc, vous devez, comme vous l'avez déjà fait, vous joindre à ce Zoom. Et lorsque j'aurai terminé de parler, je vous invite à mettre euh, le volume du Zoom au silencieux, donc le mettre en sourdine, puisque la traduction en français va être à travers la ligne téléphonique. Donc, je vous invite à prendre votre téléphone, si ce n'est pas déjà fait, et à appeler euh, le numéro TELUS sans frais qu'on vous a envoyé euh, avant le webinaire. Donc, je vous ai aussi ajouté le numéro de téléphone et le code d'accès des participants et participantes dans la série, euh, de, dans le chat euh, de ce, de, de, du Zoom. Donc, vous avez juste à vous joindre euh, par votre téléphone et vous allez entendre notre interprète, Michael Cardi, euh, vous euh, faire la traduction en français de la présentation d'aujourd'hui. Euh, je vous invite, et c'est vraiment important, à mettre votre téléphone sur mode silencieux pour pas que Michael entende à la fois euh, la présentation et puis du... Euh, des sons, euh, des sons qui viendraient de, des différents appels téléphoniques. Donc, euh, lorsqu'on sera, qu sera rendu à la période de questions, donc autant les participants en anglais qu'en français vont écrire leurs questions dans la, dans la partie questions et réponses du euh, webinaire. Et puis moi, je vais traduire les questions du français vers l'anglais euh, pour notre présentatrice. Donc, on a préféré faire une session bilingue pour assurer que autant les participants francophones qu'anglophones aient accès à l'ensemble des questions. Donc, je vais retourner euh, maintenant en anglais pour le reste de, pour le reste de la session. Euh, ah, aussi, peut-être juste préciser qu'on vous a envoyé la présentation PowerPoint euh, à l'avance. Donc, vous l'avez vous probablement reçu il y a environ 10-15 minutes avec le courriel que vous avez utilisé pour vous enregistrer. Okay, so now I'm back uh, in English for the session. Um, so about the session today, I hope you all had a chance to look at the materials we sent end of the call. Um, so we have decided to use this approach of sending materials ahead of the call and then providing you uh, an access to an expert to ask questions because this is something that was uh, raised in the needs assessment that the SPUR program did in the fall. So participants were, the needs assessment were asking us to have access to an expert to ask very specific questions based on the, the issues they, they were facing. So this is why we've decided to use this uh, two steps um, uh, training approach. Um, our presenter will provide an overview of the materials, but the main objective of the session is really to ask uh, questions. So hopefully you have the chance to look at the videos and the NL materials, and these will be available on the Spirit Change website after the call. Okay, so I'm now pleased to introduce you to our presenter today, Denise Butcher. So Denise Buchner is a credential evaluator registered with the Canadian Evaluation Society. She has over 20 years experience carrying out monitoring evaluation and research evaluation activities using qualitative and quantitative methodology. Uh, she has also uh, used operational data to measure project outcomes. Denise has worked exten extensive in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and in Canada. So thank you very much, Denise, for being here today, and I will let you now uh, share your presentation. Okay. Uh, 
I'm just bringing it on. Okay, uh, hello, nice to uh, meet everyone electronically today. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I'm going to do uh, less than about 10 minutes of um, just a, an overview of the four micro learning sessions that were created and that we will talk about today that my goal really with these first 10 minutes is just to jog everyone's memory, maybe uh, help you think of some questions you might want to ask, but I'm not gonna go into detail because that is in the presentations. So just to start, uh, the presentations covered uh, gender sensitive planning. Now I know a lot of you will have already created your indicators for your project, but I would really encourage you to look at those and make sure that they're gender sensitive. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, do your quantitative indicators provide separate measures for men and women? That's easy to do, even if it's not already uh, stated in your indicator. And do, you, do your qualitative indicators separately capture men's and women's experiences, opinions, attitudes, and feelings? Um, so this is important, it's a priority of the Canadian government and aligns with the Canada's international assistance priorities. I'd really encourage you to follow these uh, as they're key for what Jack is looking for right now. Uh, the first micro session covered smart indicators and there was a, a like a worksheet that you could use to determine if your indicators are smart. Um, again, I really encourage you to look at your indicators. Uh, and by smart, we mean specific. That means that they measure only what they intend to measure. And so they're not actually measuring two things or more, that they're measurable. And this means that they're feasible to measure it. Like, have you thought about how will you collect data on this indicator? Uh, that, that they're attributable, that what you're measuring is actually attributable to your intervention and that that's clear. Uh, and that they're relevant. That means that you're, you're likely to achieve that indicator uh, in the time span of your project. Your, data, your indicator should also tell you when your data will be collected, like at baseline or midline or endline. You know, regardless of if your um, PMF or uh, anything like that is, is accepted, I really encourage you to look at your indicators and make sure that you're actually able to measure what you said you would measure. Now the, the slides basically talk about three types of qualitative or three types of data collection, qualitative, quantitative, and operational data. The majority of the slides focus on the first two. Strength, strengths and limitations to both. And I really want you to encourage about, uh, be encouraged about collecting data from one or the other or a combination and not to think that one is a better data collection than other. Uh, qualitative data is a really great way to collect rich, detailed data. Uh, it, you can pioneer new ways of understanding and respond to local situations. However, uh, the conclusions may differ. You, you, qualitative data is not usually generalizable beyond the group that you're talking to. Um, there's increased uh, chance of ethical dilemmas. And it, it can be time consuming to, and expensive to gather, that, to gather that data if you're doing it well. Quantitative data has other strengths. It can be representative of your population if you do it right. That means you can really say uh, what changes your program or intervention has made across the whole population. Uh, it, can, it can be objective. Um, you can sometimes repair, compare results with other studies. And in some cases, it can be collected quickly. However, it's a, it's a, to do it well, it's quite complicated. You need to know what your sample size is. Uh, you need to be able to sample within the population. It can be very expensive for that reason. Um, you may lack depth because your questions are usually, uh, you know, five responses to choose from, and it requires complex statistical analysis usually. And again, there's operational data. I would really encourage you, uh, no matter what you're doing, to collect operational data and think about how you're collecting about that at the beginning of your study. So that could be if you distribute uh, certain items or you train people, 
keeping track of those numbers, keeping disaggregated data, that means you know the gender of the people who um, you give things to or you, or you train, uh, you know the areas where you've done this, you know the ages of the population. Um, I would really encourage you to think hard. We didn't go into detail in that in these sessions. There wasn't space to do that about setting up a monitoring plan. So that's a plan to collect data like throughout the lifetime span of your study. Uh, we talked about in the presentation principles to consider for gender sensitive data collection. Again, this is really important with the priorities of the Canadian government. And uh, briefly, some of these principles would be that uh, women collect data from women and men from men. Uh, I would encourage you to seek diversity in your respondents. So yes, we need data from women and men, but you may want to include, also think about different age groups or disability or um, ethnicities, you know, whatever is relevant to your intervention. I really encourage you to avoid tokenism, meaning, uh, try to avoid having 10 focus groups with women and one with men and so that way you feel like you've included men, including a balanced view of all the stakeholders in your intervention is really important. Again, it comes up over and over, collect disaggregated data. Wherever you're collecting data, ask about gender, ask about age, ask about other relevant um, data points where you could disaggregate your data. Pay attention to diversity. So this means you may need uh, more groups than just women and men. Uh, and consider the environment where data is collected. So this means um, regardless of whether it's qualitative or quantitative, is it, are you, are people responding to your questions in a space where they feel safe and they can talk? This particularly is important for vulnerable populations. Um, can they, um, will they speak freely? Do they feel safe to do that? Are their children interrupting? Are their community members watching? Really pay attention and spend time on that. Also, I would really encourage you to manage your expectations. And I think this is particularly important with qualitative. It can be very difficult to put um, people in a room, especially vulnerable people who aren't used to having being asked about their opinions and expect them to talk to you. It may take time, it takes relationship building, it takes a, a, um, a facilitator with good skill. You may have to tweak your questions. So I would encourage you to go out, try your questions, see how it goes, and then be open to tweaking things. And again, take time for data collection. Data collection takes time, it takes money, it needs to be built into your budget and your timelines. Don't try to rush it and just get it over with so that you can get on with the important part because the, the data collection is, well, it's the only thing that's gonna tell you how your study or your intervention has worked. Uh, throughout the, uh, all four micro sessions, I'm pretty sure I mentioned consent in every single one of them. It is so, so important. I'm not gonna read this slide to you, but please be sure that you have informed consent no matter how you're collecting data, uh, especially when we're working with vulnerable populations. Research or evaluation has a bad history of exploiting people and taking advantage of them and not telling them how their data will be used. So please take those considerations into uh, consideration, take them seriously, get consent, keep that data private, de-identify data, and um, try to fix the poor reputation in some communities of data collection. Qualitative data collect collection, I've talked about it a little bit. I just want to um, say when you do qualitative, make sure you have a plan for sampling. Qualitative data collection is not easy, it is not second rate, it is not something anybody can do. You need a sampling plan and you need to recruit respondents. That means if you're working in an intervention area, you need to identify who your stakeholders are and where they are and find ways to uh, connect with people who live close to wherever you're working or far away, people who are um, more vulnerable and less vulnerable. Uh, you need to talk to government people, but also you know, people in the community. So just think about that. I gave some suggestions on the slide. You need a data collection tool that asks good questions. Again, I put suggestions, on, I put some guidelines on what is a good question on those slides. 
you need to plan to get out to these communities. And in red on this slide is you need a moderator who has good technical and communication skills. Do not skimp on training your qualitative data collectors. You can have the best tool that's asking the best questions, but if you haven't spent time training your person who's gonna go out and ask those questions, then it's not gonna go well. So I would just really encourage you to think of this as every bit as technical as any other kind of data collection. Now we move on to the slides talked about quantitative data collection. Again, uh, it's a slight, it's a, it's a more complicated process in that you probably need to bring in, if you're trying to make it representative, you, you probably need to figure out what your sample size is and how you're going to sample. You often need outside expertise for this. Uh, again, you need to develop your tools. There's some examples and guidelines for how to ask quantitative questions in your tools. And, uh, you know, please have a look at those. And again, training your data collectors. Training is really important. A lot of times I see, you know, um, people have really big surveys and they plan to do two days of training is not enough because uh, you need to spend time with these people and make sure they know what they're doing. At the end of the day, it's how the data gets collected out in the field that's really gonna matter. Uh, some general tips for uh, developing survey tools, again, include demographic information everywhere you can include that. Uh, if you are using standardized tools, do not change the order, wording, or number of questions that are talked that are used to ask or measure your indicators. I work with standardized tools a lot. So it, depending on what you're doing, I work with demographic health surveys or a mix from UNICEF tools. And I often, often see organizations that take those tools and then change them and put them out there a lot shorter. The, the wording has changed, but when you do that, you're no longer measuring what you thought you were measuring. Um, think about the logic in your survey, who's gonna answer what to question and how they're gonna skip. Again, that's covered in the slides. Uh, where appropriate, include other responses in your quantitative uh, questions. So uh, that kind of allows a little bit of options for people to answer something other than the five options you've given them. But again, there's guidelines because you actually shouldn't do it for every question. Please look at the micro sessions. Be sure you're asking only one question at a time and avoid asking too many questions or irrelevant questions. It is very tempting to put a lot of questions, especially in a quantitative tool. Um, but be very, question, uh, be very careful. People spend time out of their lives to answer your questions. Respect them by only asking questions that, are, that you're gonna report on and that are relevant to your work. Because if you're just gonna collect them and analyze it and know them, there's um, ethical issues around that. And uh, so that's it for me. Uh, my uh, very brief uh, run through of what was involved in the slides. I hope most of you had a chance to look already, but I believe we can open it for conversation now. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Denise, for this overview of the materials that is already available. And just to let every, everyone know that uh, the slides will be avail available for participants. So the slide that you could uh, watch via the video, we will share them as, a, as PDF after, after the call. Um, this recording will also be available, uh, unfortunately, in English only because the French translation is happening on another software, but um, the recording will be available as well. Um, so for the question and answer period, so we are inviting you to ask your questions um, in the, the Q&A uh, chat box and I will read them to, to Denise. So they could be either in French or in English. And if they are in French, we will translate them uh, for you. Okay, so we don't have question yet. Um, <laughs> so hopefully they will come. So if you have the idea of doing this um, micro learning session was also to support organizations who are currently uh, designing their baseline uh, survey and going to the field soon. So if you have like immediate questions um, about the work that you're currently doing, this is a, a good moment and a good opportunity to ask questions to Denise. Okay. 
Okay, so a question from Bella. Uh, what if due to circumstances beyond your control, for example, security, you cannot have the same sample size for both the baseline and the headline survey? Um, well, uh, the, the, the slides indicate that you often need some sort of uh, expertise in that way. I would say, um, I would say that you would need to ask a statistician how to analyze that. But I think in the end, what you do is you analyze your data uh, with your different sample size and uh, your statistician does your confidence intervals, whatever, it would probably impact your confidence intervals if that changed. And then in, in situations like that, I think what's really important is that you just write it up, that you just, document your limitations um, and often when you're working in a conflict area there are limitations uh, and things happen and it's not really a problem that you have limitations it's a problem when you don't report on those limitations so I would say uh, that you do what you do and there may be a way if you uh, ask uh, somebody to um, increase your sample size in other areas I'm not fully sure but um, I would say that you just have to report on it is, is what you have to do. And you just have to work with what you've got. I hope that helps. And if you make any kind of, um, all, all, you alternate, do any kind of alternative thing, just record it and report on it. I don't think GAC expects you to work in a perfect world. They know that you're working in tough situations. So all you can do is report on it. Any other questions? No, oh, I think there's one. Um, yes, yeah, so you offered guidance on survey sample size. However, what guidance might you offer for how many focus groups are enough? How many key informant interviews are enough? Oh, well, that depends on your project. So usually when we do uh, qualitative uh, data, we work towards something we call saturation. So saturation means you're doing focus groups or key informant interviews, and you start hearing the same themes over and over again. So um, when you start hearing the same things, then you have saturation. So usually what I do is I take an educated guess. I, I would probably look at who all my stakeholders are. And like, let's say you have women and men and adolescents and maybe grandmothers. It depends what type of study you're doing. I would say, well, you know, I want to talk to, um, four focus groups of women and one's in a rural area and one's near a health facility and one group is, I don't know, uh, somewhere else or something like that. And you might do the same with men and you're gonna do two grandmothers and two adolescents, one with boys and one with girls, something like that. I would probably start with that. And then you look at the data uh, with your good guess and say, have I reached saturation or at the end of my data collection, I'm still getting new emerging themes coming out. That's the gold standard for how it's done. I know that's hard for planning. Like, so I think it takes a little bit of uh, your own knowledge of uh, your stakeholders. Start by looking at who your stakeholders are and then uh, go from there. And um, if you haven't reached saturation and you can still go out and collect more than do that. Okay, thank you, Denise. So we have a few additional questions. So one question from uh, Paula. So thanks very much for the presentation. I appreciated your point about paying attention to diversity when asking questions. And my concern is that we often can reinforce the gender binary in how we ask our questions and how we disaggregate data. Do you have any best practices, tools, or guides on how best to ask non-binary gender identity questions? particularly within the development sector where language, culture needs to be taken into account. I have found it difficult to come across good practices on this for data collection and for data disaggregation. Yeah, you know what, I'm gonna say that I, I don't have any resources. I, I know it's an issue. 
around, um, like I assume what you're talking about is uh, if you go into, um, if you put a tool together and say, are you male or female? Um, and you want to put in other categories, um, how do you do that? I, I assume that's what you're asking. Um, you know, I work a lot in the Global South and we get a lot of pushback if we try to do that in the Global South. So um, I would say that you would need to connect with your stakeholders and ask them, like instead of looking for something that's published and online, ask them what's appropriate in their communities and how they would like to collect that data and possibly try to use it as a teaching moment for thinking about other ways of collecting data and not um, um, you know, continuing that binary that you talked about. You might have to be a bit of a forerunner <laughs> in that situation. And then report on it, write a paper, so everybody knows what you did. Okay, thank you, Denise. Um, so one question from, well, from Adrian Martel, who I assume is some it's someone else who <laughs> is connected under that name. Uh, what are your views on using data collected by others for a baseline survey? For example, existing MICS or a DHL or a census survey. Sorry, so um, can you just repeat the question? Uh, is it, did, did she want to know what my views were on using others to collect data? What are your views on using data collected by others for a baseline survey? Oh, like, um, like using the mix tool to report on your baseline, for example. Um, I think it's an excellent idea, actually, um, because, and in fact, I believe, well, I don't think it was GAC, I think it was Johns Hopkins University was actually encouraging it, because uh, qu quantitative data like a, a mix or a DHS can be um, very, you know, expensive and complicated to collect. So if there's a recent uh, mix or DHS in, in your area and they have data on your indicators, whether it's um, uh, antenatal care or delivery or whatever, uh, you could use the data for that, ADA, for that um, area. I would just caution you though, because um, <clears throat> DHS and mixed data isn't representative at the um, like county or district level, whatever those uh, smaller levels are. It's representative at the national level. So that becomes a bit of a problem. But um, I think it's a good idea because I also feel there's some ethics around going into communities and collecting the same data over and over and over again. So if, if UNICEF or DHS has been in there and they've collected mixed or DHS data, I think there's some ethics around going in again with your study and collecting it again and probably coming up with very similar indicators. <clears throat> I recently did a, a project where um, I did the end line, but the baseline was not it was really poorly done and so it wasn't even usable data so we ended up using the dhs as the as the baseline it was actually a mix as at the baseline and then we used the uh the data that we collected at the end line um so i think it's a good idea it's efficient use of resources Okay, so another question from uh, Rosemary Forbes. So in terms of comparing your baseline with your endline questions, I understand how you can use similar quantitative surveys at both the beginning and the end to compare results. But how do you integrate, for example, qualitative focus groups? Uh, for example, you will have learned things during the course of the project and may not want to ask the same questions at the end um, as you did at the beginning. Yeah, so that's the beauty. Well, first of all, I just want to point out that you mentioned that you can use similar tools for the quantitative at the beginning and the end. You have to use the same tools and the same methods. So um, just to point that out quickly. So that part's fairly easy. That's the beauty of quantitative is you do the beginning and the end and you find out your differences and uh, that's quite powerful. Now, the beauty of your qualitative is that you can do exactly what you're saying you're doing you can ask your questions differently at the end in a qualitative study than you did at the beginning. That's okay. What you do is you just analyze your, your 
baseline qualitative data and um, you find out whatever it is you're going to find out, whatever people think or feel or want or whatever. And then at the end line, you ask them about their um, experiences with the, inter the intervention or whatever you did. It's a lovely way to do things. And uh, it's lovely if you have both to report on both. And the thing about qualitative data is you could never repeat it anyways. That's sort of the hallmark of it. Whatever you do at baseline is like a stamp in time. It's your picture of that moment. Um, and at the end line, it's another picture. They're not, I mean, they're somewhat comparable in that you can say at baseline, uh, you know, if I, I don't know what your topic is, but, um, you know, people felt this way about domestic violence and blah, blah. And at the end, we did other ones. And in those ones, people had more knowledge or, or they were more able to speak about domestic violence or whatever your topic is. That's kind of the beauty of it is you can switch it up and ask different questions at the end that will be reflective of that moment in time, that stamp. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so the next question from Rose Hamoa, what is good sample size that is reflective of a demographic with diverse groups, for example, vulnerable minority groups? Sample size for a quantitative study? Um, that's something I, I wouldn't be able to answer without knowing a lot more information about uh, your, your project. That's a, a, a really complex question. It, it, depends on, um, it depends on your population size and it depends on uh, how many people are rural or urban or what you're trying to measure. It depends on what indicator you're trying to power your sample size on. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I would need a lot more information to answer that question. Okay, and the question it, it didn't ask if it was um, uh, what kind of uh, if it, what kind of methods. Just to clarify, uh, the next question. I'm sorry. Sorry, if it was qualitative, then we talked about that in a previous question. It's it's whenever you reach saturation, is is your sample size, and it's a good guess at the start. And if it's not enough, you add more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question from uh, David. So a follow up: What are your views on uh, key and key informant interviews versus focus group discussions? Should we try to do both? And since we are doing our focus group discussion and key informant interviews at baseline, should we do the headline with the same people, or is it okay to do the headline with other people? Also, do the headline survey with the same participants or new ones? Okay, uh, so that was three questions. I should have a piece of paper here. Uh, the first one was, just tell me the first one again. But, and just he, he, he add uh, after that, that it was a similar question to one that you already respond. So maybe you can focus on the additional piece. So I will, uh, I will say the first one again. What are your views on uh, key high versus um, focus group discussion? Should we try to do both? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's, it's entirely dependent on who you're talking to. Uh, they're, they're both good. Like, for example, I would normally do uh, focus group discussions with like um, community members or like groups like school children or um, uh, men and women or uh, maybe health workers like kind of to, in, in my mind anyways they sort of would naturally be people that you'd put in a group but usually uh, I would do a key informant interview with like stakeholders who are like from the government for example like a, a health minister uh, well first of all you're not going to find very many health ministers to sit around a table and and um, they just sort of lean themselves towards a key informant interview so uh, what I wouldn't do is um, put do key informant interviews with say a whole bunch of community members like uh, focus group discussions are efficient in a way because you can get you know between four and eight max people in a room and get their views and often if it's a good mix they will sort of feed off one another and the conversation can get a little bit deeper 
it can also go the other way because the focus group can be intimidating and uh, maybe people won't talk. So I know I'm not really answering, but I think, I think both are important and it just depends on the nature of your stakeholder, whether, where you, you think you're going to get the most information and what's most efficient for your project as well, right? Because if you can do a focus group for an hour and talk to eight people, that's a heck of a lot worse than talking to eight people each for an hour and then doing something with all of that data. So think about efficiency as well. So what's the second part of that question? So the second part of the question is, um, and since we are doing our focus group discussion and key informant interviews at baseline, should we do the headline with the same people or is it okay to do the headline with other people? Yeah, I think that's the one that sort of repeats. And yeah, yeah, you can do it with other people. That's totally fine for qualitative. Mm -hmm. uh, the third one was also do the endline survey with the same participants or new one or new ones? The endline qualitative survey? Uh, I don't know. It's not. Oh, if it's quantitative, it can be different ones. If it's quantitative, oh, well, even if it's quantitative, like if you do a survey, like a, 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 a quantitative tool in a, uh, you don't have to go back to the same households. No, you absolutely don't. In fact, you're, you're somewhat better off just draw, drawing a whole new random sample and uh, doing another random sample. You see, the thing is with a qu quantitative study is when you get your results, is, is, it should be, if you do it right, uh, representative of the whole population. So it's not dependent on you going back to those exact same people and asking them the questions again. I mean, theoretically, if you drew another sample with all entirely different people and you did it all two weeks later, you should come up with the same results because it's representative of the whole population. So no, you don't need to, you, you don't need to same, choose the same communities or the same um, people. I know some people have done that, but it's not needed. And it's not what one, any of the major um, research, like MIX or DHS does. Okay, so the next question in French, so I will translate it. So does the, does the level of confidence in your capacity to reach a goal can be considered as a qualitative objective? And what is the best way to collect this information to get a good baseline data? Grab a piece of paper. Can you say that again? Yeah. Uh, does the level of confidence in your capacity to reach a goal, to, uh, to reach a specific objective, for example, can be considered as a qualitative objective? Yeah, sorry, writing it down. Um, yeah, that would be a qualitative one. I, I assume that's come off your PMS. That's one of your um, indicators. Uh, level of conf confidence and capacity. So the problem with a, a, an indicator like that is it's really, really hard to measure. Uh, it's, well, I mean, you, you could measure it with, um, uh, it could be qualitative in that you could ask people about their level of confidence, but you could also um, ask a question of uh, how confident do you feel, you know, uh, very confident, somewhat confident, uh, not very confident at all, you know, these types of things. That might be an easier way to capture it. Uh, it's just very hard to measure um, confidence and capacity. So um, actually come to think of it, I would probably measure it with uh, questions that um, ask, you know, how confident they feel, if that's appropriate. Um, but you could also, you know, supplement it with focus groups. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Denise, and thanks, uh, Juliana, for the question. Um, so I just want to do a little the time check uh, because we still have about five minutes, maybe a little bit more, Denise. Yeah, right. right. Uh, and we still have about five uh, five unanswered questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with the next one. Uh, from Deborah. So thanks for the presentation. One of the issues we face with our project data is that even if our data is exceptional when comparing baseline to headline, government and research institutions are not keen to accept, utilize project results because they point to potentially con 
crowdfunding factors not being an RTT, et cetera. Is there anything we can do more at the baseline stage to help make project data more useful to decision makers? Yeah, so that's really important and I'm glad it was brought up. Uh, you've pointed out a, a big problem and um, the, the thing that needs to happen and maybe you've already tried it and all I can say is you need to keep trying is to engage local stakeholders, bring them on, make them part of the meetings, have them ha develop the tools, have them be engaged and really put resources into that because if they're not engaged and you just go about and do your work and then hand them your results, and especially if they don't like the results, like they, they indicate that they haven't done something well, uh, they are not going to accept it and you're, it may not make a difference. So, you know, the fact is, is that all of these projects are trying to make long-term, sustainable, um, transformational change type differences. So bringing on those stakeholders and getting them engaged and you know inviting them to the table is so important and even if you've tried that and it's not working just keep trying it's really important okay thanks so the next question is from uh, victoria so we often talk about returning data to the community where we collected it to empower these communities with this knowledge Others suggest to share data with local governments who often lack detailed information of their own population. Do you have any recommendations on how this should be proposed? Yeah, I mean, if you can get back to communities, it's good practice. Uh, you know, when you take information from people, you deserve, they deserve, um, some sort of result. The, the problem is is that it's it's hard and it costs money and you know especially at the end line maybe your project is over so how do you go back but um, you know without knowing the details of your project I would say to try to build that into your plan to, to get uh, results back to communities uh, wherever possible um, you know even if it's a, a, a you know, some messages to local leadership that they can share or something like that. Uh, and as far as uh, sharing with uh, like government, yeah, it would just like the previous um, question, super important um, because without their buy-in, your, your project won't have any sustainability once your project is over. So um, yeah, find ways to give them the data, invite them to a big, um, some sort of, showing of the data, um, have them be part of that, maybe have them preview it before it goes up. So they're not surprised, they're not sitting in the room and they find out that you know, you're know you telling everybody that they're, something has gone really badly. Um, you know, Just keep them engaged, make sure you do that. Okay, good, so next question. Uh, what are your views on doing large multi-stakeholder participatory workshops as part of qualitative data collection instead of or in addition to focus group discussion and key informant interviews? Uh, I just think, I think it's different ways to collect data. I think it's fine. I just think you need, if it's a large workshop, you need ways to collect data because like when you're in a focus group, you're in a semicircle, there's eight people, you're recording it probably, and you're um, really able to focus on it. But if it's a large workshop, so how are you going to get the data out of those workshops? Uh, what are you going to capture? Um, I think workshops are a way of generating ideas and items to be followed up, but I think it might be hard to get specific detailed data that you would analyze from a workshop, although it might help you focus your questions. Uh, but I would just say if you're going to use a workshop, you need a way to collect data. So that could be uh, mini groups within the workshop that you are recording and collecting data from or it could be um, like an exit survey when they leave or an entrance and an exit survey when they come in and when they leave um, just think about you know how are you going to collect it and how, how are you going to document it because it can't just be your observations that's the thing you can't just be there and say oh this is what i think happened it needs to be somehow documented so 
you'd have to figure that out. Okay, so we still have uh, three questions and one comment. So, well, let me know, Denise, when uh, when um, okay. you you have to go because I know you have another meeting following this webinar. Uh, but let's try to let's try to answer them all. And um, so the next one is from Paula. I'm really interested in community-led M&E approaches. From your experience, have you come across any good tools or organizations that are doing good community-led or community-driven feminist m and &E within their development programming? Mm. Um, you know, it's something I would have to look up. I couldn't really uh, get it off of the top of my head. I'm sure it's out there, but unfortunately, uh, it's not really a question I can uh, really answer right now. Uh, I would have to search it up the same as you, but I'm sure it's there. Okay, so I'm I'm not, I am now going to share a comment from Colomb and then move directly to the next question. Uh, so just a comment: using only data collected by others could be a part of your data collection process. Organizations need also to collect primary data directly in the field, especially if data collected by others are collected a few years ago or are not updated. There is also a risk of missing some interesting info useful for your project by only using these data. So organizations should use both data collected by others, but also collect data about actual context of the implementation location and from beneficiaries to make sure they could make data triangulation and get a base, best baseline data. So I don't know if you want to add anything to this, Denise. I think it's, it's all true, yeah. I mean, uh, that's right. If you're going to use data that's collected by others, it should be recent data, up to date, and it should be uh, representative of your area. And of course, um, that would be, you know, relying on it solely. It would be good to collect some primary data as well. Oh, of course. Okay, so the next question is from uh, Bella. So what are your thoughts on incorporating a controlled versus treatment group? while it is stronger to attribute changes observed to project intervention but is there also an ethical aspect as well uh, for example to purposely withhold support from the project for the control group yeah so that's always ethical um, because the controlled group is only telling you what um you know what happened in the other community but you know in a lot of the work that i do anyways um the other problem with the control group is it's never a true control group because um, we don't generally like generally we're, we're working with social situations and, and in environments where there's many organizations operating so if you have a control group you don't know if there's another organization over there in that control group running an intervention it's not like they're not getting anything they might be getting something different so while it some might argue makes for better research it, it also um in this it's not like we're in a laboratory setting and we can uh, totally exclude other influences so it's it's not as robust as other types of control groups and it also adds a lot of expense um to your to your study uh to to have a control group if you're doing a quantitative study. And there's certainly the ethical dilemmas around asking people about their access to healthcare and then doing nothing to improve it. And then coming back and asking them about access to their healthcare again, three years later after you've done nothing to improve it. So yeah, definitely ethical considerations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the next and last question all is also related to having a control group. So this is a question from Victoria. Uh, the question is in French, so I will translate it. So uh, if we do, for example, a quantitative data collection for a baseline study in six rural communities, is it relevant to also to have a group control, for example, could we do data collection in a, t in a tiers, uh, third party, a third community, I'm not sure how to translate that, sorry, uh, where the project doesn't have any intervention? Sorry, are they asking about the control group again? 
Yeah, well, this is from a different person, so there might be um, overlap between the two questions. Uh, yeah. So I'm sorry, I was a little distracted because my other call okay. came 10 minutes early and um, so just repeat the question. Okay, me. so the question is, if we are doing data collection in, for example, six rural communities for a baseline survey, is it relevant to have a, a control group, for example, to col collect the same data in a community where we're not working, where we don't have a, a, an intervention? So that just goes back to the previous question about uh, the control group. It's not necessary. It does change your sample size, though. Like, um, you need to uh, account for the fact that you're not having a control group. Like, when you put up your study design, if you do say a cohort um, study, then, um, you know, it, it does affect your sample size. So, um, so long as you have the right sample size and the right sampling in the communities where you're working, you, you don't need to do the control group. I think I answered that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was similar to the previous one. So there's a last question. Do you still have time for I it? Have like, I have like a minute because I, I basically hung up on my other people who are wondering. Okay, so very quickly, how can we determine attribution versus uh, contribution in testing solution environmental environment, especially in social change case? Sorry, can you say that again? Um, Yes, how can, well, I just moved this question to the hands on piece. So I, uh, it was, how do we, how can you, okay, how can you determine attribution versus contribution in testing solution environment, especially in social, social change case? Um, <laughs> you, I mean, it would depend how you set up your study. How, how are you measuring it? What are your indicators? Like, that's why your indicators need to be really specific because your indicators have to be able to tell you if they're attributable to your intervention. So um, how can you tell if it's attributable? Well, you would tell by looking at your indicator and is your indicator set up to measure something that is attributable to the project? And if it's not, it could just be measuring, you know, other things that are happening in the community. So it, it kind of goes back to having those really specific smart indicators that uh, are clearly, it, you can clearly trace back to, to your project. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Denise, for answering uh, uh, almost uh, like 20 questions, I believe. So this was very uh, helpful. I just want to tell participants that we, for those who would like to go further to these uh, micro learning sessions, that we, the SPURT program is organizing in-person training on data collection uh, project cycle in March across Canada. So the, the um, this in-person training will go beyond the content that we saw today and beyond the content that was um, available uh, for you uh, prior to this uh, to this call today. So, for example, we will talk about uh, community um, community participatory tool when you do data collection. We will talk about the use of technology, user-friendly technology uh, while doing data collection. So we will share in advance a draft agenda of this training. So we are organizing the training across Canada in up to seven locations in partnership with uh, councils. Um, so, well, we are going to share the, we are going to open the registration by the end of this week or early next week. So um, stay tuned. Uh, and please join me in thanking Denise for our materials and for answering those questions today. So I, I, I think and I hope it was very helpful for, for everyone, everyone who attended the training. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank you, everyone.